Back when I was a developer, Docker wasn't really a thing, but I ended up learning it through necessity over the years. And it can be a little bit frustrating to begin with, especially when you're used to setting up services and troubleshooting the technology stack that you're most comfortable with. However, once you dive into the world of Docker, I'm sure you'll look back and wonder how you ever got by without it. Today, we'll be looking at what Docker is and how you can use it to deploy, manage, and test web applications. If you're interested, in a future video, we can also dive more into Docker Compose and how I use that to deploy my CTFs. Let me know in the comments below. As always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and let's dive in. Let's start with some quick theory on Docker before we spin up a service. Docker is an open source platform designed to automate the deployment, scaling, and management of applications by using containerization. Containers allow us to package up an application along with all of its required parts, like its dependencies and libraries, and ship it out as one package. Now, it's not the only container technology that exists, but it still dominates the other tools section of the Stack Overflow 2023 survey. So definitely worth taking a look at. So how does it work exactly? Well, we know it operates on the concept of containers. And unlike traditional virtualization, which virtualizes the hardware, which leads us to running multiple OS instances on a single physical machine, Docker containers share the same OS kernel and isolate the application processes from each other. So first, we have Docker images. And this is the basis of a container. An image is a lightweight standalone package that contains everything needed to run a piece of software. Next, we have Docker containers. These are simply running instances of Docker images. They encapsulate the application, dependencies, libraries, and the runtime. And finally, we have the Docker daemon, which is a background process running on the host that is responsible for building, running, and managing containers. So before we dive into the hands-on section, let's take a quick look at what some of the benefits and the drawbacks of using Docker are. Starting with benefits, we have consistency across development and release cycles, isolation, portability, and resource efficiency, at least compared to using VMs. Some of the drawbacks are the learning curve, though that's the same with any technology. Misconfigured containers can also introduce security issues, especially since they share the host's kernel. And managing persistent data can also be tricky, along with setting up networking, which for me is always a bit of a headache. At least these are some of the issues that I've personally run into. Your mileage will of course vary. Let's deploy an application. So now we have an overview of Docker. Let's go ahead and deploy an application. So what we're going to do is deploy an application that's ready to go from Docker Hub. We can pull it down, spin it up and interact with it. For most popular applications and services, this is all we need to do. And this is really useful for pen testers or application security engineers or researchers because we can just grab something, spin it up, and then it doesn't matter whether we break it or whether we test exploits that potentially crash our targets. And we can even carry out research and find new exploits like this as well. So generally speaking, really, really useful for an application security engineer or web app pen testers day-to-day -day workflow. And of course, it saves us a day of building and configuring a server. So in this example, we're going to be doing a pen test for a company and they have a Magento site and we found an exploit for it, but we might want to hold off for a number of reasons. So the exploit might be destructive and we could be testing on production. So we don't want to go ahead and fire it off straight away. We might be on a red team engagement and we want to be stealthy. So we want to verify the vulnerability and its fingerprints or its impact before trying it on the target in case we only get one shot and we can't run it multiple times. We might only have a low privileged account but found a plugin that we want to look at a little bit more closely, but currently we don't have access to the configuration or the administrative view of that plugin, or we might be doing research. The list goes on really, but these are some of the examples that I've run into in the past. So let's grab the latest version. And all I'm gonna do is pull up my terminal and I've already located Magento here on Docker Hub. So I can see that we have Magento packaged by Bitnami. And I should take a moment to say that not all images on Docker Hub are safe. 
Probably a lot of them have malware, so stick to the ones that you think are reputable. And personally speaking, I wouldn't just pull something down and throw it into production. I would probably build and package it myself, but that's a topic for another day. And you can see we have the docker pull command here, so we can just grab this and then come over to our terminal. And because we're working locally and I haven't set up the Docker groups, I'm gonna use sudo, but once again, don't do this on a production system. And I'm gonna pull this down and I'm also gonna say, hey, I want the latest version. And here you can define different versions. So grab the one you need, but in this case, we'll just do latest. While it downloads, if you are looking to secure your Docker containers, I would recommend starting with the OWASP cheat sheet series. And we can come to here, OWASP cheat sheet series. That's not what I was looking for. It's this one, I think. Here we are. And if you come down to cheat sheets and search for Docker, you can see we have Docker security. And here you can start taking a look through this document. And this is some of the best practices on how to get started securing your Docker containers. So for example, keep the host and Docker up to date. Don't expose the Docker daemon socket. Set a user, limit capabilities, etc., etc. And the nice thing about the cheat sheet series is it's not like a 300 page tome. It's very practical information that you can use straight away and you don't have to spend a whole day reading about it. So I'm going to let this download and I'll see you back here in a minute. So now this is finished, we could actually run this image, but Magento, as with most applications, is made up of multiple components, usually an application and a database. And if I recall, Magento also uses Elasticsearch as well. So we're actually going to use Docker Compose to create these and configure the settings. So if we come back over to Docker Hub, we can come down and have a look at the instructions. And if I recall, here we have get this image and then we keep going down and we have how to use this image and it gives us a reference to this docker compose file so let's just go ahead and copy this so i'm just going to copy this and all this does is curl to raw.github user content so it grabs the file from bitnami containers main bitnami magento docker compose.yaml and writes it out to a docker compose file so let's take a quick look at this file. So if I just vim docker compose.yaml, we can see that it has some information at the top for us. And also it's using docker compose version two. So I think two and three are the main ones that are supported currently. And it has some services. So MariaDB, as we predicted, it uses a database. This is the image that it's using. So it's using MariaDB 10.6. And there are some environment variables. So as you can see here, allow empty password recommended only for development. So we'd probably switch this to no if we were going to use a production server. And then we've got a username and also the database as well. So next up we have Magento and we can see that it's grabbing the Magento and it's grabbing version two. And then there's some port mapping. So it's mapping ports 80 externally to 8080 inside the container. Same with 443. If we connect to 443, then that will route our traffic to 8443 internally. A bunch of environment variables and some volumes which are needed for persistent data. So this service depends on MariaDB and Elasticsearch. And as you can see, we have Elasticsearch here and the image. And this also has a volume. And then we have some volume information down here. Not super crazy. Of course, you can have a look at the documentation to see what else you can include in there. But let's go ahead and run this. So what I suspect is that actually, since we pulled down the latest version here, what we could do is we could go into the Docker Compose file and change that to latest. But just for the video, all I'm going to do is sudo docker compose up and I'm just going to let it pull down whatever images it needs to pull down. This is going to take a few minutes, so I'll see you back here when it's done. So now this is running, let's browse to localhost and continue our setup. So if we just come over to here and type in localhost, hopefully we'll have a functioning Magento site. And it looks like everything is working okay, so we can carry on with the setup of this application, or we can just go straight into our testing.
Now there are a few other things that we might want to be able to do, such as look at what running containers we have. We might want to be able to connect to those containers. We might want to stop them, start them, view the logs, remove them, etc., etc. So let's run through some basic commands. So sudo docker ps is going to list the containers we have running. And as you can see, we've got Magento, MariaDB, Elasticsearch, and also it looks like I left MongoDB running as well. And if we sudo docker ps-a, we're going to be able to see all of the containers that are on the system, but stopped as well. So if we want to stop a Docker container, we can sudo docker ps and grab the container ID. So here in this first column, We've got this for the Magento, this for MariaDB, for example. I can just copy and paste this, and then we can sudo docker stop, and I'll pass in the container ID, although this will break our application, so I'm not going to run this, but this is how we would stop it. And if we wanted to connect into Magento, for example, maybe we wanted to inspect some code, we wanted to run something, we wanted to understand the structure a little bit more, sudo docker exec, dash it, pass in the container ID, and then I want to drop it into bash. Sometimes if you're connecting to something like MongoDB, you can do something like, hey, I want to drop into Mongo SH, for example, but here we can drop into bash, and as you can see, we're on the container here. So we're inside the container and we can do anything that we need to be able to do. This is especially useful if you're working for file upload vulnerabilities and you want to verify things like, hey, what directories can you write to? Or did my payload actually make it up? And sometimes it just makes testing a little bit easier. If we exit out of this, we can clean up our Docker containers with sudo docker rm and the container ID as well. And if we want to clean up the image. So let's say, hey, we're no longer going to use Magento. I don't need the image on my machine anymore. We can use sudo docker rmi. Now, if we run into errors while we're working with Docker, as I do every single day, um, Google, of course, is a great place to start. But if you're working with something that's not sensitive and you can copy and paste the error messages, ChatGPT is actually a great way to troubleshoot a tool. Often Stack Overflow has similar issues, but maybe in a completely different environment. And ChatGPT is pretty good at singling out things and being able to go a little bit deeper. So my recommendation is use it, learn lots of new things. And of course, over time, you'll become more and more comfortable using Docker. And that's it for this video. If you'd like to see more Docker or other technology introductions, then let me know down in the comments below and I'll catch you next time.